Um, see that we're recording. Okay. Um, so this brings us to the conclusion of, of uh, the, the argument that Graeber makes about debt. And I mentioned this in a previous session that as someone who has spent his life academically studying capitalism and living through its ordeals uh, since the, the 1980s, the late 1980s, when I first started reading Karl Marx, um, I was expecting a, a much bigger, more thorough, robust analysis of capitalism where I really thought that he was going to kind of show what made capitalism after 1492 unique, especially considering uh, arguments that, that Graeber has made about us historically living under really a one world system since 1492, that once with Columbus, um, that that initiated a process of a global bureaucratization that we're still uh, 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 a part of today. So I expected him to, to really, uh, you know, sort of say more about what made capitalism in the post 1600s as rapacious as it was, and he ended up not. And as I thought about it more, I realized that there are good reasons for that. And it's because his very idea of capitalism is built on an idea of morality that it doesn't take technology, it doesn't take wage labor, it doesn't even take enslavement in order to create capitalism. Capitalism is instead a moral system that requires the, the belittling of one agent who produces or strives for something, a third object that has value above and beyond what this belittled person is deemed to be capable of producing. So it requires a structural inequality that gets baked into the relationship from the start. And so it's from the start a moral relationship, which I, I mean, honestly, I had never really thought of capitalism as a moral, as first and foremost, a moral relationship. And that's precisely what he has spent these 5,000 years of history revealing that the moment one begins to think in terms of debt, salvation, and redemption, there is then necessarily some redeeming force out there. And it's one submission to this outside redeeming force that gives capitalism as a moral system its insidiousness, because it means that no matter what is in us isn't really valuable enough because we're never going to be able to pay down our debt. We're only going to be able to live in circumstances where we hope someone will absolve us of our debt. And debt and guilt, we've now learned, are one and the same. Sin and guilt are uh, similar. And so we have, by the end, this moral system that it's nothing more than a than moral compulsion that has driven us to think that we can't pay our debts. And he ends the book, this has kind of gotten some, some play out there um, from people. And he even commented on it, um, uh, but before Graeber commented on it before he passed away, where one of the last chapters, he talks about all of the gold and silver that's uh, beneath Liberty Place in Lower Manhattan, right there um, uh, on the bedrock of, of, um, of Earth. And he talks about how when he grew up, he learned these conspiracy stories about all the gold that's beneath there and that later in life he learned that in fact that gold is there it in fact is it's widely believed that there is gold there but when 9-11 happened 
these conspiracy stories started surfacing again because people started wondering what happened to all that gold. I've even heard uh, stories that have gone so far as to say that 9-11 was, was in fact deliberately done so that people could get into those vaults and secure that gold and, and secrete it away somewhere. So here's why I mention all of this, the same reason why Graber mentioned it in kind of a surprising way is one of the things that people kept asking him about. If you think of these conspiracies, they all turn on some kind of secret knowledge that we don't have, that we are not privy to. And so really what keeps capitalism afloat as a system is imagination. We imagine that this is the way things have to be. We imagine that if they don't play out this way, that the world will collapse. And there are enough of us, myself included, who, you know, I have a, I have a 401k. <laughs> and so as much as I don't think that markets determine my livelihood, 401ks, if they melt down, you know, that, that's going to mean something. I don't necessarily think that it's the end of the world, but good luck disabusing people who, who check their 401k balances regularly. Good luck disabusing them of the idea that, that that's just not even real and that it's not even there. But we only believe that it's there to the extent that we allow ourselves to imagine that there is a future. And, you know, we don't even know that there's a future. I, I'm going to go ahead and bank on a future, but we don't know. And so that's where the book, having kind of gone through it this many times, is where it leaves me. It leaves me with the exact passage that he, he David Graeber, used to um, conclude the revised, not the revised, the expanded and updated edition that came out, I think, in around 2017 or so, he ends it with an anecdote about, and it's this famous anecdote that anthropologists love to tell, which is a, a there's a, a, a man on the beach collecting coconuts, and or he's got some coconuts, and then a British man, a colonizer, arrives and says, oh, just think what you can do with all those coconuts. You can start a coconut business. It'll be very simple, collect all the coconuts, crack them. Like, you know, you can do some assembly line production, hire some people. And the guy ends up asking, you know, well, what's all this for? And he says, so that you can retire wealthy and you can spend your life sitting on the beach eating coconuts, which is of course what he started life doing. So capitalism is such a silly system because we're living for, for this fake dream that like for some people will come true and they will experience material rewards unimaginable to the likes of me. But for most of us, it's just, it, there's no future. <laughs> I'll pause there. <laughs> Love to hear from folks. Okay, great. I think that's a punk rock le lyric, isn't it? No future. Da, 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 da. Okay. Who, who wants to, any, some comments on what they thought about this chapter? Go ahead, Zach. Hi. Um, so I guess uh, it, it's not so much a comment, but kind of leading on um, Stephen's kind of summary. Um, I'd like to raise a question for pretty much anyone to answer. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about, like, over the course of reading this book is, um, how do you go about encouraging other people to imagine alternative systems? Because, you know, over the course of like, just having a debate or a discussion with people about capitalism, it's it's really hard to kind of you know, pull people out of the matrix to, to any extent, really, right? Like, um, uh, it, it seems like 
there seems to be a failure of communication for us that want to abolish capitalism to, you know, present an alternative to people. Um, you know, despite the fact that people are obviously very angry with the system. So just an open question. Um, um, well, I, I'll, I'll give you my answer, um, which I don't know, um, full disclosure, I haven't kept up with the reading for about a month now. So um, this is not coming from the book, but um, I've never believed that you can confront it by naming it and analyzing it and um, explaining it to people. Um, I, I think th that we're sort of st stuck with a market system and that the best we can hope for is, is for it to become humane instead of um, brutal. And, and I, I think the path to that is not to use any language from Marx or any language from anybody, but just talk about it in terms of, of everyday things that aren't right and, and uh, encourage people to think about making some things right, you know, that's how it seems to me possible to move forward. I don't know. Hey, go ahead, Christian. Okay. Um, well, may maybe two things. Um, morality and apocalypse. Because uh, if I if I jump, if I take Steve's deliberations and I jump to the end of the chapter, uh, the, the last section is actually called uh, something, I think apocalypse or something with apocalypse. And I mean, if, there's this famous saying, um, which I think is um, attributed to Mark Fisher, who said, you know, people can, e it's easier for people to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And, but if, if you take Graeber's argument at the end, it's, it's, he says like, look, all the time we've had capitalism, people were thinking about the end of capitalism. So already like hundreds of years ago, not just like in the eighties when we had the cold war, not just now because of climate change. Um, and he says, but that doesn't seem to bother capitalism. You know, if you, I want to anthropomorphize it. Um, but what seems to bother capitalism if people take it serious. So if you wanted to end capitalism, um, you should encourage people to become fully capitalist because then the system breaks apart. Um, I mean, this is this is also a bit nihilistic, maybe, but I'm, I'm just taking the the argument of, of David Graeber at the end when he says, like, look, this the moments in history when capitalism started to come off the rails. These are the moments when people became really truly capitalist. And um, the other part I wanted to say is like when, when you said it was basically it's a morality play, right? So. Um, and if, if I understood his argument here correctly, is that the moment capitalism came in, when he said, like, if you conceive of the basis of human relationships as debt, and then you go and criminalize debt, and then morality becomes bad, so everything associated with it becomes bad, this is when you get capitalism. So um, it's it's not really... It's not a good way out. I'm not really sure he's suggesting it here, but I think you, you could make that argument that capitalism would abolish itself. And maybe as a final argument, um, like I think last year or sometime, I read another book by a um, Dutch historian. His name is Bas van Babel. And I forgot the name now. I can put it in the comments later on. And his argument is basically, he says, capitalism is not new. You know, because, you know, a lot of the, the um, arguments around capitalism, there's this new system that came in uh, with industrialization as of, I don't know, 1400 something. And he says, no, that's not true. And he makes some pretty convincing arguments that there were, you know, not as a worldwide system, but there were individual systems of capitalism in old Persia, maybe even Rome. 
and he traces this and it always ends badly. So maybe this is also something to, to kind of that it in the end it'll always you know wreck itself so maybe maybe there's hope here I, I suppose that depends on whether or not when the temple falls down you're inside the temple or outside of it at this point many of us are inside the temple whether we like it or not um but I suppose from a climate collapse perspective, it is good news that a large percentage of the world's food production is very simply made peasant agriculture. But for those of us in the cities, wow, we've um, we've uh, carefully tied our, so we'll, we'll, as Steve says, rely on our 401ks to feed us. Um, so uh, the um, I just had a couple questions, like, um, which I thought would be a uh, great, um, very beginning of the chapter, um, he argues that all, let's see, um, you know, this return to bullion um, that happened, and then he goes on to explain that, you know, that the gold standard was kind of uh, created in, in and supercharged because there was so much gold that was coming out of the new world. Uh, however, really, it was also the fact that the gold was being pulled through to China. Maybe that gives us a chance to, to ch for Joseph to chat about his discussion about paper money in China and gold coinage in China. But um, it says all the axial age pieces reappeared, right? So vast empires, professional armies, massive predatory warfare, untrammeled uh, usury and debt peonage. Uh, but also materials philosophies, a new burst of scientific and philosophical creativity, even the return of chattel slavery. Um, it was no simple repeat performance. All the axial age pieces reappeared, but they came together in an entirely different way. So I, didn't, well, I would love to hear people's theory of why, what's different now. If the axial age, he emphasized coinage, he then else he goes on in on page 326 of my version. Uh, part two is titled The World of Credit and the World of Interest. So even at the same time as John Locke and uh, uh, Newton, I don't know, it's mainly Locke, but I guess he, it gets called Newtonian economics is what Graeber calls it. Um, and again, remember the word Newt Newtonism was used at this time as a symbol of efficiency in workplaces. So Newtonism is a precursor word for um, Taylorism when Taylor said, you know, does time stops of people's time motion stops of people in the factory. So the worker will literally be on an assembly line. It looks like Charlie Chaplin's this, you know, modern world uh, film. Newtonianism was a word that that but Newton, in addition to being a scientist and an alchemist, was also a um, the official mint person, like the um, all this kind of concern that the gold might be fraudulent. The government had to prove its own credibility. Um, so Newton was the guy who officially in London came and did a chemical test on the coins to say, you know, bid it and said, yep, it's real silver. Um, yep, it's real gold. This is officially. And uh, Locke said, no, we can't have these credit systems, you know, all of this. We need gold coinage because gold, because we'd seen the South Sea bubble and all these kind of people betting on the markets. And they basically said, oh, speculative. It's not tied to anything. The entire economy will go up and down. Some people get rich. Lots of people get poor, but the whole thing is a bust often. So they they then say. It's like they're claiming they're on a gold standard. Um, they the, and the Graver, Graver makes this difference between the world of credit, the world of interest. Um, and interest is when you say you're going to get money and your money can increase forever. Like money makes money. I suppose the credit, which is like, I, I like you, I give you, I trust you, I give you some credit. And it's a back and forth. I'll owe you, you'll owe me. Um, and that was actually how having a good credit system built economies, but usually on small scales, like a tally 
Um, and at the same time as there's all this gold coinage, and there's even then paper money is, is created, the Bank of England is started as a sort of the debt of the king. Um, this, this sort of this paper money, um, even though the, the Locke's idea was a disaster, it was deflationary. And uh, if that's correct, I, maybe someone will correct me, but I thought it was deflationary. And um, there was a, when they put, uh, when they claimed the gold standard, there was a huge poverty and woe amongst people, but rich people had some access to credit and including the new credit systems, which were paper money credit systems, right? So I guess, um, how do we understand the sentence, the axial, all the axial age pieces reappeared, but they came together in an entirely new and different way. One of these new ways is paper money, which is tied to gold standard. So somehow the, the shopkeeper I'll credit is slowly crushed by deflationary gold standard that destroys the economy. And then they create um, money, paper money, but then they make coinage tied to that paper money, and the paper money is tied to the gold standard. Any comments on why this age and the actual age, according to David's system, are the same thing, but very different? Same, same factors, but have different, same pieces are there, but they're arranged in a different way. We now have this paper money. Perhaps I misunderstood, but I I thought it was that this age was more of a return to bullion rather than credit systems that use paper money. Yeah, so the name of that chapter, that section part two, the world of credit versus the world of interest, is that even in this period, um, the world of, of credit exists in the shopkeepers and the working class people and the world of interest and sort of this coinage exists in the upper elites, the big money that is circulating. And then he says how, when he says, when he comes to that last section, uh, or not the last section, the last section was apocalypse, but the one before the last session says, so what is capitalism anyways? He says all the features of capitalism existed well before the industrial revolution, well before factories and wage labor. And that's what people normally think of as capitalism because that's when people started to identify it. Marx wrote, this is capitalism. Um, all the syndicalist organizers even before that were saying this is a capitalist system. And um, there's the new writers about capitalism that invent economics. But he says before economics, before all that, capitalism existed. Um, and I wonder if um, before that, we still had localized credit systems and the crushing of the economy of localized credit systems comes from the top down. People who traded and had, you know, in a normal way that they'd done even in the Middle Ages, you know, with the tallies and credit systems. So you can loan something to people, but it's pretty hard to collect a debt. You lose your money if it was a stupid loan but they start to use more uh, violence to collect debts, more state interest to collect debts, plus people stop using tallies and eventually they're all using paper money, but paper money with actual coinage. So that paper money comes to replace, you know, coin the coinage. And the paper money is in some sense state declared based on the king's debt. So the credit, so yes, it is about bullion being uh, the being uh, taken up, but taken up by destroying that credit system. So he's, he has the, the name of that section is about the destruction from the top down slowly, uh, like over a hundred year, 200 year period of local credit systems. Yeah, and I, I think what he's getting at there is that as those local credit systems broke down, they that meant that they, that that also entailed the breaking down of various lines of community, so social solidarities that were supported by 
those local credit avenues are then going to dry up and then be replaced. If you notice, he talks, he, he brings in interest and inter essay and he starts talking about Hobbes. And I think what he's getting at there is that as these local credit networks are being crushed and being replaced, they're being replaced by a bullion system that is about inter essay or interest. And that the interest now is basically a kind of an authoritarian interest where only those who are in a position of, of, of authority kind of have the, have the opportunity to recoup money by extending credit, which is now interest. But the difference is the interest is now an individual market oriented interest that is for the sake of the individual. So if the individual does a calculation and doesn't see a good enough upside, that's really the only thing that matters. So this kind of, so there's now a moral hazard that, that comes into to play that I think is only available to certain people if they are in a position to extend these these lines of now what are really lines of interest because you're only extending lines of interest if you can expect at least a 5% or better return, in which case if you don't, then you there's too much moral hazard and you don't extend it. I, I, I think that might be part of what he's getting at is that not only as credit dries up and is replaced with interest or usury, that that usury is also reframed in individualized market dictated ways where people, of course, I mean, the markets aren't dictating it. It's people that are dictating the markets, but as people become to dictate it in ways that privilege interest, those credit markets, the local credit markets are disappearing. And, and I think that the connection that he's making is that this is a form of state formation. And that if we think of this as introductions of efficiencies and markets, that that's really not doing full justice, that it's really, it's a Leviathan state under Hobbesian kind of modeling that gets created in the 1600s with Locke, um, you know, providing the intellectual scaffolding. Uh, Locke was also on the uh, the Virginia um, com uh, Virginia Corporation uh, as a, an advisor. He never went to Virginia, but he advised them, and he, um, in some sense, created the Terra Nullius legal interpretation. I'm not sure whether uh, uh, whether he created that per se, but what he did do is he made a philosophical statement about purity that land uh, must be developed and created. Uh, improved, and if it's not, then nobody has done anything, and you can just claim the land. And therefore, the Virginia, they basically made a judgment that said the Native peoples don't, haven't improved the land. So one, that's not true. They had a whole system of land use, which was far more sophisticated than chopping down the trees, you know, and, and and whatever they, they, the early Virginia colonists were able to do. Um, but they said that, and then they, and, and then they claimed all of the land of the native people. So Locke is involved in the original theory of property that's also emerging at that time, um, which again is before wage labor, again, before um, um, factories, all of that. And, um, um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. So that's another lock tradition. Oh, the other thing I mentioned is there's a little footnote in there um, when he talks all about um, this capitalist system moment. Um, he, um, he mentions, oh, I'm not arguing against the idea that capitalism starts with land enclosures, which is the typical argument that... Um, there was primitive accumulation, like basically they, the state and the aristocrats grab hold of public land, they make it their own, and they own it. 
So he's that's a typical thing. He's he he says in a little footnote, he's not arguing against that. That's very that's still very important in his system. He just doesn't mention it because that's the normal theory. So he only is writing about this additional stuff to add on to the typical thing, which is a, a very small footnote, but it's worth mark remarking that he's not really disagreeing with the stand some of the st more standard lefty um you know the origin of capitalism from feudalism how about christian maybe going back to your original question like when you said like the pieces came back together differently you know this time around as opposed to roman times to the ancient times um i think when you said like like in, in the case of this book, the first time around, it was coinage. So it was really based on physical coins. And the second time around, when they reintroduced it, it was to some degree an, an imaginary, a utopian project. I mean, David Graeber mentioned this several times in this chapter. He says Adam Smith was essentially a utopian. Um, and because there was so little money, actually. So they, they went back to money, said this is real money, and we can only work with real money and not with imaginary things. But at the same time, a lot of it was just made up, and a lot of the exchanges and businesses worked with, I don't know, notes, and you know, they set up the Bank of England and they they traded in debt, and it was all debt meant for war at the end of the day. So uh, if if I understand this correctly, well, in, in like the, the ancient times with the Greeks and the Romans. The goal was the goal, you know. Alexander's army ran on half a ton of silver a day, and you actually had to have the silver on hand. And then in the new version, they basically just said it was up until I don't know 18 something when the mint could actually produce enough coins so everybody could do this. So in a way, the idea that we have of capitalism and its formation is like this stuff always worked. Like you know, we had coins, you know, they did this stuff. But, you know, the daily lives of most people didn't involve any of the stuff we um, consider to be the basis of capitalism. And um, it, it's, it's kind of funny if you think about it. I just heard like an interview today where somebody was writing also about the origins of capitalism. And he said, has said pretty much the same thing. He said, like, Adam Smith was an utopian. He was also a bit of a capped man because he had like, you know, a, he was working for an oligarch of the time at the time. And he was living basically in his house and he was paid all this money to kind of come up with these arguments that did not reflect reality. Over time, his, his vision became real. But at the time he wrote all this, nothing of this was there. So that's, if you say he's the founder of capitalism, this is not true. You know, also it, it would go hand in hand with Graeber's argument here that it's like what um, what Steve said in the beginning about the morality play. So the morality came in and then they put on top of the morality, they put the, now we have to have coins and everything has to run in a certain way. And then they kind of work towards this, even though it wasn't really true for a long, long time. I think this is maybe part of the difference. Okay, great. Joseph? Hi. I wanted to share a little timeline that I made based off of some of the dates that are presented at the beginning of the chapter on capitalism. And I wanted to share my screen, but I can't. It says, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Is that possible for you to disable or enable? Um, yeah, I suppose that uh, generally we don't do uh, do the screen sharing thing, but I can, we just try it out. If we all collapse into uh, horror, it'll be, uh, that'll be, that'll be too bad. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't know if I can actually. Um, how about if I... So the, the way we, we, we make Joseph a co-host and then he can, through his own, uh, he can share. Okay, try that, Joseph. You're okay. now a co-host. Oh, wow, that was easy. Thank you. So can you see my screen? It's kind of a bare bones timeline. 
Yeah. So the beginning of the chapter where David is going over, um, mostly it's the timeline of what happened in China um, with their shift from the paper money system that the Mongols used in the 13th century to um, 1368. Peasant revolt begins the Ming dynasty and they are suspicious of commerce and they have high taxes and um, farmers are fleeing their lands. And then there's a silver rush with illegal mining and there's um, sort of this black market commerce where silver is the real currency that people are using, but it's not the way that taxes are accepted. Taxes are accepted in labor or in kind. And then the Ming dynasty in the mid 15th century tries to shut down these mines. Um, but this leads to peasant revolts where the miners are joining up with the displaced farmers and, um, and they're, excuse me, and, uh, and so then the Ming Dynasty, to respond to this, changes course. They stop issuing paper money. They legalize the mines. They allow taxes to be paid in silver, and this allows them to abandon the the labor uh, taxes in the form of labor and in kind. And then at the same time, uh, late 15th century, um, the gold and silver uh, begins to be exported from the Americas. And then we... He mentions that the Chinese mines are exhausted. Uh, and then in the early 16th century, they, they find new mines in Japan, but these are quickly exhausted. And so the, the Chinese silver is, comes predominantly from the Americas. And then at this same time frame in Europe, uh, there's this process of inflation of the silver denominated prices. Um, and then in China, there's the they eventually change the tax system from being based on rice to based on silver. And then Manila is founded by the Spaniards and there's this uh, more efficient route to get silver and gold from the Americas to Asia instead of rounding the Horn of Africa, they just go directly across the Pacific. And then by the early 17th century, China is importing almost all of its silver. So anyway, I made this tiny little timeline but the reason I did this was because I was I was confused or I was I was curious about the pattern that that he's describing at the beginning of this chapter, where it seems like in China, there's almost the opposite thing happening as in Europe, where in China, the real currency that everyday people are using is silver. Um, but the government makes it illegal, whereas in Europe at the same time. And I didn't add this to the timeline because David didn't add specific dates in this section. Um, but maybe in other sections you could piece it together. Um, but basically in Europe, he describes how the everyday people had very little silver because even though there was this great export of silver and gold from the Americas, most of it was going to Asia and there wasn't very much uh, for everyday farmers and peasantry to, to have on hand. And yet taxes were demanded in silver. And so... I just thought that was interesting that in Europe, there's not, as I understood it, I mean, this might be wrong, everyday people don't have access to metal, but the government is demanding taxes in metal, whereas in the early Ming dynasty, taxes are demanded in labor and in kind, not in metal, but metal is what people have. And that the responses in the two different parts of the world were very different, that in China, the Ming dynasty shifted course and accepted the fact that the economy, the real economy was based in silver, and in Europe, they didn't shift away from demanding taxes in metal. They kept things that way. And instead of uh, appeasing the revolting peasants, they just exported them to the colonies. Yeah, that's that, that's interesting. And it uh, works well with that, that comparison that he makes uh, um, maybe at the beginning this is why did Europe do this? Was it just a, an, like a systematic thing or did they make choices? Was there really something crazy about Europe? Um, and he says, look, anybody could have done this, but other places could have been in the position to do this, but they didn't. The Ming Dynasty, for instance. So that real is very interesting comparison there. How about Joanna? 
Hi. I actually haven't read any of the book yet, but I thought I would introduce myself. <laughs> uh, but I actually love David Graeber. I read uh, Bullshit Jobs, which was awesome, and part of uh, The Dawn of All Things, which was also really good. Uh, so, and I think what has drawn me to these issues, like, well, first of all, even with like the gold standard, uh, as opposed to paper money, but at the end of the day, like, why does gold, like, where did we figure out why gold has value in the first place? Was it because it was rare or shiny or a good tool? Uh, like, why? Uh, is it just as random? Uh, and, uh, uh, but anyways, in my life, just like I feel like I'm so much more intrigued and disturbed by global wealth and equality than anybody else I know. So I have to find comrades. And then for me also, and maybe I can find conversations about debt or whatever, is like, I'm interested in the actual ethics of wealth accumulation, period. Like, can you even have a 401k and not be a complete hypocrite if you actually are speaking the language against corporate capitalism and if you don't have a 401k, then realistically, what is, like, how do people even accumulate wealth? What is even realistic? And is any of it ethical? Which is kind of beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think that people who are interested in David Graeber might also be interested in those questions. So anyways, nice to meet everybody. Everything's been really interesting so far. Thank, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, you know, and I, I really appreciate your points um, about the, you know, the overall ethics of, of this um, and how the ethic, the ethical dimension is the burden is always felt on those who feel the ethical compunction to do some thinking about it. You know, that's sort of one of the 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 great burdens of of thought is is um, if you don't bother having the thoughts, then you've never had the thoughts to be bothered by them. And so I really, um, you, you know, th these are these are you know your points are just right on uh, completely. So thank you for joining us. And um, and yeah, it's the kind of thing where if you haven't read the book. You know, we would still love you to to join in. So, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because the groups start. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Uh, these groups start with all kinds of people, and then a few people get like are like, "Oh, I've got to." You know, we're like trying to read a big book that's like this thick, and the group gets kind of smaller and smaller. So it's great that people come, um, it anyway, and stuff like that, and uh, they can. You know, hopefully it's useful because like like most of us are like kind of running to finish a chapter or trying to I was quizzing Christian on what was the meaning of certain bits of the chapter that I hadn't I'd only skim read uh, before we started. Um, so um, I, I. I was I'm going to say um, the um, how about the, the various different types of paper money, because if the axial age had coinage and coinage replaced the um, uh, coinage was what replaced the kind of credit system. And again, the credit system is human to human. You've got to know the other person. You don't have a lot of coercion. You can't kind of just grab them and shake them down until your money gets back. The coinage system, you didn't have to know people. It, it, and it started to be an absolute measure of money. And then when people then added debt to this absolute measure of money, where you could, the coinage was quite quick and you could transfer it, you could have a definite like coinage, in some sense enabled people to say, yeah, that's definitely gold. That's my money. It's even though you didn't know someone from the, you lived in China or you lived in, it's, oh, that's definitely silver or you lived somewhere else in Europe, like the Genoese bankers. And this coin, um, well, the coinage transfers, 
So we have this big chunk of gold, but it's the actually the paper money um, gets is used to tie down credit systems. And then it seems to me that those credit systems, the paper money, actually becomes tied to the gold standard, at least whether or not it is per se or not, we could all debate that, but they claimed the gold standard because they they wanted a materialist space to say our system is scientific because they'd seen all the speculation that happened. I guess maybe that's part of Christian's kind of thing. If you just let capitalism go with no rules, it would eat itself quite quickly. Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out the section that said the different three different ways of paper money. Um, uh, we we'll just interject here. Um, yeah, go ahead. Like really, the the the, uh, the last paragraph in this chapter, uh, where David Graeber basically says. Presented with the prospect of its own eternity, capitalism, or anyway, financial capitalism, simply explodes. Because if there's no end to it, there's absolutely no reason not to generate credit. That is, future money, infinitely. Recent events would certainly seem to confirm this. The period leading up to 2008 was one in which many began to believe that capitalism really was going to be around forever. At the very last, no one seemed any longer to be able to imagine an alternative. The immediate effect was a series of increasingly reckless bubbles that brought the whole apparatus crashing down. And uh, one might make the argument that after 2008, when the system was, you know, bailed out, um, we just went on with it, you know, and then debt creation was, uh, has risen to levels that haven't been reached before and there's a lot of people who currently believe you know like uh, what, what's going to come next and that may be I, I wonder if this maybe has to do with like the the, the um, what Fukuyama said at the uh, you know the end of history when the Soviet Union fell apart and he said like okay now we have reached the end of history because this is the system and it will be eternal and the first thing it does is starts to destroy itself um that's also when they say um uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, because in the 90s um, or the early 2000s, people definitely said that they come through, you know, that the, the 80s period, the 70s and capitalism had created a bunch of ways in which it moved credit around to create stability even. And they kind of felt they have this global technology to manage the money system. And they were just going to go on forever. Plus, they, they were slowly crunching wages down more and more as they are now. So there's much more of the money that exists at the top end rather than the bottom. Go ahead, Peter. I think you wanna unmute. Okay, there, there it goes. Um, what it seems to me is that there's uh, two different money systems. There's there's a money system that's sort of like credit, but that's controlled by the central bankers, and they can still control the supply of that credit. And that was kind of what was going on in the 70s. And then the, the other uh, system, which is really a credit system, is what goes on on Wall Street to this day and what went on in 2008. And it's virtually, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve doesn't do anything to tamp down speculation on Wall Street. It just tamps down wages, you know. Um, so the real credit system is what goes on in Wall Street and it is unrestricted and it is experiencing all those, um, predicted, you know, cycles of failure and, and insanity that, you know, been going on for a long time. Uh, and that's, I, I just think of it as a credit system rather than a money system at that level. So, I mean, credit is money, but you mean credit versus a coinage system. 
Uh, I'm trying to distinguish between a money system that um, has some authority riding herd on it and or uh, a money system that's similar, but nobody's riding herd on it so that it is un, un, unrestricted is as long as they can contain the money supply, they can sort of control the behavior of the population or all the people that participate in it. But um, that's not what happens on Wall Street. So it's a different form of a money system. Yeah, and in this chapter, they also say money, so money that just, it's enforced by your trust, money that's enforced by law, as in someone will use force to, and a court system to go grab your debts. Um, but then there's also, there was interest. That's the other distinction to make. Um, a credit system between people and an interest bearing credit system, which is primarily between the, the wealthy or that access to this kind of paper money credit systems. And those are all on, in my book, uh, page 338. And they talked about um, the, these different systems. One was um, you could have a money paper money system by just countersigning bills of credit. And they talked about that's where paper money originally came out in China um, for the Middle Ages. And then you could have a, um, a paper money system where bankers produce money by issuing credit on their own bank. Um, and they issue more than they actually have. And they talked about that's really dangerous. And then you could also have a credit system where the state roughly is, is like a bank, but the, it's the state itself, which is the, is the guarantor of violence in the society. We're, we're the biggest kind of bad guys around and we and basically they and that emerged from people trying to fund warfare so war of the state wanted the people who were the biggest baddies around wanted to make sure that the second biggest baddies around or the biggest baddies in the next place over they had to go to war with them so they they wanted to finance those wars and they issued uh debts but they could charge taxes and that made them and i guess if you see, they're claiming that the, the system of paper money that came out of this period was based on the government doing that, which was the same in the actual age. It was coinage was minted by the government to pay for their war. But here it's paper money uh, that's maybe for, for kind of metaphysical reasons backed up with gold, but it's paper money that establishes paper money is in some sense a new a new coinage um and that yeah i agree with that absolutely um I'm sorry if I, if I jump in here again um but uh you know going away from the book and towards the current situation uh with with the money supply basically i'm not really sure i can agree with you here peter because um what the fed probably did is um, when in 2008 happened, the banks had, you know, massive debts on their books. And the assets that were supposedly to back up these debts, they were nowhere near as valuable. So you had a massive discrepancy. So the value of the assets was much lower than the value of the debt. And then the government decided to save the banks. And they started pushing out massive amounts of money, which in a way, was a way to create asset price inflation. So all this, the, the, uh, the government, the Fed specifically, but also like the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan, they put you know trillions of new money into the world market to put to artificially push up asset prices because you can either bring down the debt and then destroy like all the 401ks among other things, or you bring up the asset value. So what we've had since 2008 is a massive inflation in asset prices. So houses, stocks, and all that. And the reason for this is that all this money was handed to people who already had money, who then started buying up all this stuff, thus bidding up the price. 
And the problem you have now is that you can't stop doing that because the moment you stop doing that and people have to face up to the reality that the inf uh, that we've spent, what is it, 15 years artificially inflating um, the asset prices, you know, there, there's no basis for all of that. And then you have to have some massive correction. Oh. And people, and you know, I don't think anybody has the courage for that. Oh, I absolutely think you're right about all that. But what I'm trying to, or how it seems to me is that those um, massive debts that were uh, backed up by the, the government, you know, creating money out of nothing uh, were already, um, you know, it's, it's the, the too big to fail thing. They, uh, they, they, there were all these debts on paper that were unenforceable, completely unenforceable because they weren't based on anything related to the real economy and still aren't. Um, and, and the government pumped that back up which I think you're, I think that's what you're saying that they pumped that back up, but they did it by giving the money to the banks. And as you said, the banks went out, bought assets and, and made us all worse off by uh, fewer people owning more and more of the tangible assets of the economy. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's at, at the level where people talk about too big to fail. It's because the debts are on paper and they are unenforceable because they are tied to nothing. But, but still they can't stop because when they're trying to raise uh, interest rates now, that would mean bringing down asset prices. Oh yeah. And well, they we, need we to bring up interest rates to punish workers, you know, so to keep wages down. So you're, you're like in this, this you, you're, what's the word? Um, you can't get out of it basically because you can't have both at the same time. So right now it's it's really interesting to see where it is going. We saw that replay with the Silicon Valley Bank just a couple of weeks ago. So I was just gonna throw out another distinction that was in this chapter was the different, the, there was one paragraph somewhere where he says, oh, the, the debate about the gold standard and whether or not money, you know, you speculation, that was a metaphysics argument about about value right whereas he claimed in the middle ages the the complaint about you know um interest bearing loans was not metaphysical it was not a like the value is really there can you really demand that much interest or it was a moral issue about greed about the collapse of the system and this is really how this age also ends up with slavery happening again because all these people are in debt and so they with the psychology of debt they jump in and demand repayment by forcing other people to work for them and so they can repay their debts so i i just wanted to think that this argument of course yeah the the federal government and many other um central banks made up money and people could say oh quantitative easing that's um a bit metaphysical, isn't it? And not have real trust in it. But at some level, where is the moral argument, which is maybe Peter was starting to bring in, but like that it's morally wrong, the system. And how would we recapture that argument that interest bearing loans, usury, creates havoc and it's moral failing of people against people, people exploiting people. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> well, it kind of gets back to my whole thing about is any form of wealth accumulation uh, ethical? Understanding that, uh, so if you're in the top 1% of the global wealth holders, you hold approximately $1.1 million. And if you are in the top 10% of global wealth holders, you hold approximately $127. That's your 401k. So, so many people in Western society may be part of the top 10% wealth holders. And this whole freaking system, the reason why you're bailing out the banks 
and raising the asset prices is exactly what you said to save all of these 401ks, right? To save all of the interest bearing wealth that is essentially formed on interest bearing loans. So like, is there a solution that uh, one way is to just not participate or is that like even worse, right? Like one way to not have uh, the entire financial system uh, gravitate towards raising asset prices is if we weren't trying so hard to protect the top 10%. It's not really the top 1%. All the evil is done, right? Because you're trying to make sure that the top 10% doesn't go into financial collapse. And that includes all the people who worked for 30 years and all these really nice people that are our neighbors and everybody we know. But is every neighbor and everybody we know actually participating in the ultimate demise for everybody? I'm like, I'm like, does everybody need to divest their stocks right now? That's my ultimate question. Go ahead, anyone comment? Yeah, to, to, to me, there's there's a relationship between uh, uh, finan financialized assets. I mean, it, it seems perfectly appropriate to take $100 and put it in a company that makes shovels if there's a need for shovels in the world. And then when the shovel factory gets built and it becomes profitable, you get some return on that investment. I think that that kind of still fits in with the Islamic model uh, that we talked about earlier, but um, but but it, it, it does have to be, uh, I mean, it does have to be based on something tangible. And I think one of the problems that we have is that we have this system that has to produce tangible things to justify itself. Um, and so we have a marketing industry that convinces us we need to buy things that are ridiculous and uh, we're burning up the planet to make all this stuff we don't need. And what we really wanna do is take care of each other. Yeah, I was just gonna say just one qualification on what you said, Joanna, is just like, obviously that whole 1% and 10% uh, of, is based on what you think value is. Right, because Steve, I'm going to suggest to Steve that his 401k strategy can be um, to like when the economic the climate crisis catches up with the economic crisis um, at the same time, and we see a wipeout of the whole system, he can head down to Chiapas with his 401k and use it as a paper and suggest, I've got all these theories of money. Could you, tr I'd love to trade you my 401k for some potatoes. And he could countersign that. And <laughs> that might create um, one, some potatoes for Steve at, um, in his his uh, retirement. And, you know, two could be um, the possibility of um, new valuable credit systems and the idea that theories of credit systems might be helpful. But especially like, after a collapse, because we're going to because once we get rid of coinage and and uh, uh, state based cash, um, it was still might need to interact. And um, yeah, but like, first of all, like, isn't the problem here interest bearing situations? Like, is it like one is it interest period or is it like only certain types of interest? Because. That's the whole thing by participating in a stock program or any form of wealth accumulation, you are participating yeah, in an mean, interest bearing yeah. program. And if you like dissect the whole thing right now, like by just doing that, are you doing harm to Chiapas, this place that you actually really want to help? And Thank once you. there's global financial collapse, if there is finance, global financial collapse, let's say if all the 401ks get wiped out, 
if all home equity is reduced to zero, if all federal bonds don't mean anything, then nobody wants your 401k for potatoes in Chiapas, right? The actual potatoes have way more value. The only things in global financial collapse that would have value are things that actually have intrinsic value, like a shovel or a potato. So who cares if you've got stocks that are have no value, right? I don't know. I don't. I don't see how that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you raised some bunch of questions. I was having a humorous remark about for Steve, um, uh, me being from Ar Ireland, uh, potatoes being important and stuff. So that, um, yeah, go ahead, Joseph. The aspect of what Joanna just said that strikes home for me is the need that I feel for real security and the based on the, the facts that are presented in this book and also the awareness that we have of the ways in which our global financial system is not as stable as we're led to believe. I, I think that the, the tools that we have used in the past to provide for ourselves uh, or provide for our future selves are proving to be inadequate. And so we need to look for alternatives to 401ks uh, and IRAs and other financialized forms of security, but that I don't know that, I think to say that we need to first encourage everyone else to divest from the stock market before we can go ahead and figure out an alternative system for getting our needs met uh, is the correct order of things. It seems a bit like putting the cart in front of the horse because I can't speak for anyone else, but my perspective is that because I'm a human and I want to make sure that my needs are met and that my family is protected going forward, I'm going to hold on to the forms of security that are available to me now until something more effective comes along. And so it doesn't seem fair for me to ask other people to jump ship from what has worked for them until there's something that people can actually feel secure relying on that does work better and meets not just the needs of the individuals who have 401ks, but also is sustainable and equitable and all that other good stuff. But that has to come first. Can I interject and then I'll Go shut ahead. up? <laughs> is like, isn't that the whole problem that's like being discussed here? Is that people have a sense of fear and insecurity and that is what motivates them to accumulate wealth? And uh, that feels totally justified because, of course, you want to support your family and your friends. Like, that's completely understandable. How can we not empathize with that, with all people? But at the end of the day, 90% of the population, for the most part, holds no wealth whatsoever. They don't have a retirement plan. They don't have any money. And so when you say that you have to make sure that everybody's needs are met first, what you're saying is that everybody who's in the top 10% essentially of wealth holders needs need to be met first, that the wealth holders need to feel safe before we can move forward with any other ideas, or we have to like mine paleolithic history before we can ever come up with a third way. And I'm like, well, why don't people who are wealth holders actually start talking about 
how they're contributing to the whole thing that they don't even like or feel ashamed about. I don't, I just don't get it at fundamental level. So, I mean, I'll throw out a few. I, so I think it's a good question. Um, and the interest, the bearing, and it comes to the, the thing that's in this chapter, which is a credit system versus interest bearing loan. So I would speak from my perspective as a trade unionist, where I have just been on strike in England, along with every other lecturer in the university system in the UK now, um, on pay and various issues. But for a small section of the universities, there was also a pension they the 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 more um the more prestigious universities have a different pension system and that pension system they basically rearrange the metaphysics of the pension system so suddenly a lot more less um interest was charged for universities that wanted to build new buildings rather than support their staff and so that um uh the actual pension managing company was getting paid more money Right. Um, so and suddenly we had to pay less and there was less of a pension. It was a bit of a magical evaluation that they did right in the middle. So there's a huge strike about that. And we have just won that strike. And so from my perspective, um, it's the issue is, is if you people deserve a pension or a future um, and that pension or future can be family and social relations and we should have those. And it can also be that within a credit system that we have, people still need when they uh, get old to have some kind of resources like that. So it's not those fight. But what I think we should go further is those fights are not just to get our pension back from being stolen. Hey, I want in on the interest bearing scam that's screwing over Africa, the Middle East, Chiapas. Um, but it's I want to you know, to also be breaking that system down and work. And it's a traditional thing, the working class resistance of basically people trying to figure out their own interests much more collectively and tying into other people is a problem for the people who are the top of that interest bearing system. And most people who are in a pension and are fighting to, to say, hey, I got, I worked all my life and I got promised I would have a retirement um, and their pension suddenly being downsized because it was a bit of a scam on the top of the rich people's thing. Their fight will ultimately align with people in Chiapas who have much more valuable things like potatoes. Yeah, but do their interests really align? Because no, that pension no, they don't. fund is on a totally insane, stock invested, interest bearing, crazy system. So like, really? I know. I mean, I get it. You need your pension. You worked your whole life for it. You can't just have nothing. But are your interests really aligned with Chiapas? Uh, no, I don't think many people in the, you know, the top of the the top end of the America or Britain are. Uh, I'm talking have the about the top same 10 interest. percent, though. Yeah, but I mean. Uh, the other thing is the economic system isn't really run by the 1%. It's run by the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. It's like a fractalization. Uh, and there's a bunch of weirdos who are like, I'm going to the moon and we're, the planet Earth is too small for me. We're going into outer space. You know, I mean, no, but I don't be, agree with you on that principle. Like, I think, like, I I'm do, interested in economics. I've read Piketty. I think he's actually really smart. And like, that's like the whole thing, right? It's not, it is the 1%, it is the 0.01%, but the reason why they get to exist and continue and fly their space shuttles to the moon is because they have cover from the rest of the 10%, because the rest of the 10% will ultimately act in their interests to protect their own wealth as paltry as it is, even if it is just a pension plan. Okay, and so oh yeah, go ahead. Um, I won't. I'm not going to respond because I'm kind of abusing my position as facilitator to like sort of have answers. And I think you're raising great questions. Let's um take Peter and Christian, and we're also over the nine the one hour bits. So we might finish up pretty soon. We, and I and I would love to get somebody to say some stuff about the very end of the chapter. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I I I feel like there there's actually uh, a lot of validity to what John is saying. I feel that in my own circumstances, but I also feel like um, 
when the decision about Roe v. Wade came down and there was such a wave of dread and disgust in, in the U.S. over it, um, and, and there was a feeling like, well, let's have a general strike, you know, and the reality of it is, is the reason there can't be a general strike is because of the debt that we all carry one way or another. And um, it's, uh, we are debt slaves in a very real sense, whether we have a 401k or not. Um, and so anyway, I, I think that if we really want to fix anything in this world, we have to adopt a more cooperative uh, way of getting our meet needs met. Great. Okay, probably, um, Christian. Yeah, so uh, what Joanna said a little earlier, she said like people accumulate out of fear, right? And I think this ties back into the end of the chapter we've been reading right now, when he says like, um, there's always the fear inherent in capitalism that will end. So everybody's always afraid everything is going to end, everything is going to be shit. So the only way to protect yourself is by individually accumulating wealth. And as long as everybody buys into this and maybe even sees this justification to, uh, as a justification to cover their own shame as having to participate in this system, which I think a lot of people on an um, intuitive level recognize as being wrong you know, this, this is what it keeps it going. So in, in a way, um, as long as there's like fear of the end, people will buy into capitalism, you know, and um, I'm not really sure if this is true, but I, it's a thought that just came into my mind. And also, um, I kind of wonder, like, when we talked about the individual choices that we have, should I participate in wealth accumulation? Should I do this? Should I have my 401k should i invest if i think this is going to be good should i take a plane you know in the face of impeding climate apocalypse and and to be honest i've had like a lot of discussion with this with friends of mine who consider themselves also politically on the left i consider myself to be politically on the left um and i think in a way this is bullshit because um if we reduce our choices to like this is reducing our choices to consumerist choices like i can fly or i cannot fly and it's moral not to fly you know and i've spent like the last 20 years trying to you know not buy shit in the supermarket and uh trying to think about what i do but i finally reached the point where i think um all these discussions uh, are just you know they're, they're running cover for they're not being a political left anymore, a real political left. Um, all look, I, I live in Switzerland. Uh, I'm originally German. So um, if I look at the current German government, which is notionally two thirds on the left political spectrum, and we're talking about, and then we have somebody from the right. And if you take Ang Angela Merkel, who used to be chancellor up to recently, and she's a right wing, right of center politician which means she's somewhat to the left of Barack Obama in the United States, who's considered a left of the middle politician. You know, so like I'm saying, it's like it's all not very left, you know, if you think about it. Um, we don't have these choices anymore. And the discussion has devolved into, do I take a plane or not? And if I take a plane, it's, you know, morally wrong and I'm a bad person. And for individual people living their lives, you know, you have this, like, should I invest into my pension fund? Yes, you should. And if you want to take the plane, take the plane. But if you really want to change things, you have to get active on a political level. And, but I don't know how, to be honest. You know, that's, that, that's like the conundrum we have a little bit. Like, the choices being offered are bad. And we can't, we don't even have a language anymore to discuss this. And what I find really fascinating, if you look at countries around the world, that rat baiting still works in some countries. I mean, in the US, it still works. Like, you're a communist. Oh, God. You know, it's like there hasn't been a real communist 
probably, you know, you know, as a political power, communism hasn't been around for like ever. And it's still this, this smoke screen that gets thrown up and like, oh, it's all really crazy. Communists, they come to eat. I don't know. Steal your stuff. Kill your babies. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then if you look at the conflict in Ukraine, and then there's a conflation between Vladimir Putin, who's like a real capitalist, you know, and the Soviet Union. And it's like, yeah, it's we, we have to get across. Uh, what I think personally is we have to get over the individual part, because in the end, you know, if, if, if push comes to shove, the only thing you have is other people. If you want security, you need other people. And your individual wealth accumulation cannot save you. Oh, OK, great. So um, it's, it's interesting that this has um, this chapter has raised all kinds of personal, moral anxiousness and how would we think? So, uh, oh, goodness, tough. Um, uh, so how about Zach, Paula? If you want to say anything, you can pass. Uh, and Mark. And then we'll pretty much close it off unless somebody has like, a, oh, I've got to jump in because you can't say, you know, those one type of conversations. Go ahead, Zach. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say I do love a lot of the back and forth stuff because I think that uh, interesting questions are raised when we have, you know, sort of um, uh, a prolonged uh, uh, back and forth in, in some way. So I was enjoying the back and forth with you and uh, uh, Joanna. But um, I, I guess uh, the question is like, uh, you know, I think what Christian said about like we need to stop thinking about these things in terms of individualistic choices and 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 move towards uh, you know, collective decision making is a very important one. But I guess the question is, if we're thinking about these political movements in terms of uh, um, uh, a moral problem and uh, and and see like somehow cooperation and, uh, as uh, as a solution to that, what can we do to facilitate that cooperation? Because it, it, like in my mind, or at least in my personal experience, it seems like the left has, there's been a failure on the left to be able to do that, to be able to like, um, you know, uh, create scenarios where people can look out for each other. Because there there, there, there seems to be a, a bit of a tension between, say, what your ostensible political views are and what you've actually done to facilitate that cooperation with people, say, in your own community or whatever, you know, like... Um, and uh, it, it's a question I don't have an answer for, but it's something that that's been raised in my mind. So I guess to to kind of like echo that that first question I had again, uh, again, open to anybody is like, how, how, what 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 kinds of things can we do to facilitate that? Like, you know, um, community building with other people, you know, so that our action is not just based on individual self-interest. And it, it does seem to me that Part of that too is based on like how we reconceptualize how we understand the world as well. But anyway, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I want to um, answer Zach uh, and also the, the big question of what's different now, which I think is really well handled in the next chapter. And also, so the question of um, what can we do to bring people together um, is also something that I don't have time to describe, but there's definitely um, some thoughts on that with respect to an action-based um, deliberative kind of a process. But I wanted to just touch base on that concept of, well, people, when I, when I was, when I ran away from home, my parents said, here's your inheritance. And it was in stocks. And so I called and I said, I want it out of stocks. And then I thought about it, and thank goodness I was able to maneuver it back in, because what was I going to do with the cash? And I bought myself an education. And so I got rid of the money, and I felt good about that um, at the time. And um, it helped a lot of people with that education. So my main point I want to make about it is that not only are the um, educated um, intelligentsia, sort of the ones responsible to transition us, hopefully less violently towards a human-based economy, 
um, but that they won't participate if they're not safe, if their families aren't safe. And so there needs to be a conception of whatever's going to happen in the future as non-threatening, as better, as safer. And so we're not saying, oh, okay, um, hold on to um, your investments to go to slavery. I don't have, hold any of those. And I, and I, you know, have a very old cell phone and I'm pretty conscious. But my point is that I think we can bend a common sense more easily if it is um, digestible to the people who may have, maybe they're not in the top 10 or even 1%, but that they may have influence in that bending if they're comfortable in doing so without saying, we're going to need to crash the system to start over in a violent sounding way. Thank you. Hey, hey Mark, you want to throw some things out? Uh, I'll, uh, I, I can't express enough how wonderful this session has been. I it just everybody. It's just beautiful. I mean, you've given me homework for several years. Um, I just wanted to say one of the things about cooperation, I was just thinking, you know, yesterday I was a poll worker. And at the end, we had to count the ballots uh, several times. And you have all these different points of view of the people working together on this concrete problem. The numbers didn't add up. We had to do it many times. You know, we have different perspectives on the world. It, it's like a concrete problem bringing everybody together um, to work on. Um, so a part of the cooperation, and, and this is not an answer to, to Zach, I'm just suggesting that uh, that working together on concrete problems and also listening to others, which also, it brings me back actually to jo Joseph's wonderful timeline, simplifying things and getting back to the red baiting that Christian was mentioning, simplifying things and explaining things. You know, I, I really think that cooperation is possible. I, I don't know why I'm hopeful, but I am. Okay, great. So next time, um, that was chapter 11. Next time is chapter 12, the beginning of something yet to be determined. 1971, the present. So that there's all kinds of space for more conversations and we'll probably draw in lots of the other stuff from the beginning of the book. Um, so I guess we'll, uh, that next one is in two weeks on a Thursday, yes? I'm Excellent. Good. Sorry it's, if I interrupt. Didn't we decide to split the last chapter in two sessions last time? I don't know. The, you mean the, oh, okay. So, so we'll, you chapter, mean we'll talk right? about it two times? So, so the first half of the chapter versus the second half of the chapter? Is that true, Steve? Um, I think that was uh, like what we said last time. I, like, I, I don't want to force this on anybody by, by, by any means. I think that was what Nika suggested last time. And uh, I think that was like a bit of a consensus on this. But on the other hand, it's perfectly fine to do just one, especially considering that like all the people who've invested their time so far, and it has been considerable. Yeah, what, go ahead, Steve, yeah. what's your yeah, preference? I was gonna say, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I, I guess, our next one is is our final one. So I think I, I think the whole book is fair game, you know, whatever people want to come with. I know that the last couple of sessions have been uh, kind of thrown out of whack because of the one where we were disrupted and then last week that was postponed. And so honestly, I thought it was that had we had one last week, it would have been 11 and 12 and then Today we did sort of more 11 than we did 12. So next one, you know, if we, I, I think is fine as 12 or 11 and 12. I'm, I'm totally open to anything. Great. So, uh, so the next time is two weeks from now. Yes. Yeah. On a Thursday, 8 p.m. And uh, invite anybody. And Steve's going to rock out with a. Uh, a two minute summary of the entire book and then chapter 12 and 11. And 12. No, I don't know. Whatever you bring, it's always exciting. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya.